Isaiah chapter 47 this morning. Now, last week we did somewhat of an introduction to Bible prophecy as it pertains to today. We kind of used chapter 47 as a segue to get into where we are prophetically, I guess if we could put it that way, because we are um, in what would be called the prophetic time clock. And so we're going to look a little bit at that today, a little bit more, but we're going to work our way through the remainder of the chapter. And here what we have in chapters 46 and 47 is God's instruction to the people of Babylon, his warning to any nation that would attempt to in some way think that, you know, their purpose, their mission, their plan is far greater than God's. Now, this it actually is the result of humanism. It's the result of, you know, a person thinking that they are greater. And the picture here is that God is sovereign over all nations. Remember, as we read in Psalm 75, in verses 5 through 7, but Psalm 75 gives us a clear picture of this, and this is what it states here. A couple of verses that I think are important for us just to kind of look at and uh, be reminded of. Here in chapter 75, this is what the Bible says. It says, starting in verse 5, it says, Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. And this here clearly is speaking concerning God's sovereignty over all things, that God is clearly in control. Even with a nation as great as Babylon in biblical times. Now remember that this was a great nation to the point that God used them as an instrument to judge a disobedient Judah. Now, God said that he would rise or raise, excuse me, this nation up, that it would rise into power by his doing. And you might ask, as some have, where in the Bible does it speak concerning that? Well, for your further study on your own, Habakkuk chapter 1, we see the prophet Habakkuk speaking to God in regards to the present circumstance in his day with the people of Judah. And he cried out to the Lord and he said to God, how long will you allow your people to get away with this wickedness? And he's even asking the Lord, are you even there? Are you even listening? Are you going to do anything about this? The Lord says, I am working a work. And then God begins to explain to the prophet Habakkuk, before he does, he tells him, even if I were to tell you what I would do, you would not understand. So then God begins to explain to Habakkuk that he will raise up a nation and that people he will use as an instrument to judge and deal with the wickedness of the people of Judah. And that group of people was Babylon. And Habakkuk, the prophet, speaks to the Lord and he says, you mean to tell me you're going to use a nation far worse in sin far worse than the people of Judah and their sinful practices, a nation that is a Gentile nation to judge your people? And really the answer to that is yes, but also I told you you wouldn't understand because that's exactly what the Lord told him. Even if I were to tell you, you wouldn't understand. Well, in Habakkuk chapter 1, we do see there that the Lord prophesied that he would use this nation Babylon to take the people of Judah captive and deal with them. But then we also see that the Lord also spoke this very truth to the people of Babylon in Daniel's day. Now, remember that the prophecy of the book of Daniel is really important for so many reasons because it also speaks concerning uh, Babylon's rise to power. But notice what we see here. It talks about this statue. There's a uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and... Uh, God uses Daniel to reveal this dream. Now, remember, this is already where Babylon now is in power. They are a nation. They have already taken Judah captive, just like God said they would. And we see this throughout Scripture. This is what Jeremiah, the prophet, was speaking about, that the Babylon was going to take the people of Judah captive. And then what we see here in Daniel chapter 2 is this image. So once again, we're looking at Psalm 75 in verses 5 through 7 where God said that he would raise up Babylon and where he would tear them down. So 
In Habakkuk 1, it says that God would raise him up. Look at this here. In Daniel chapter 2, it says here, O king, you, O king, were watching and behold a great image, verse 31, this great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. Okay, this is a very large image that Nebuchadnezzar seen in his dream. Daniel's now interpreted and he says, this image head was of fine gold its chest and its arms of silver, and its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So this image here that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know in his dream, what is this image? Who is this image? Now, this had to do a lot with Nebuchadnezzar really being intimidated by his empire and the power that he possessed as the king of Babylon. But ultimately, what Daniel is going to explain to him is going to explain exactly who this is. And notice what he goes on to say here. He says this to him, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. So Daniel is now telling Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the only reason why you have this power, the only reason why you have this strength, and the only reason why you have this glory is because God in heaven has given it to you. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar is a Gentile king. He doesn't know the God of Israel, but this is what the Lord is sending Daniel to tell him. And then he says, he goes on to say here, and whenever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all, you are this head of gold. So this is Babylon, the head of gold. But after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another and a third kingdom of bronze shall rule over all the earth. Now, remember the picture here of this, you know, uh, idea of this, of bronze ruling over all the earth. This is the Grecian empire. But the iron, and I just want to, or excuse me, the silver is the Medo-Persian empire. So when you look at this statue, you'll begin to see that it goes on to say, and the fourth kingdom shall be as Strong as iron, inasmuch iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like the iron that crushes, the kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Now, if you look at this, you begin to see that this image that Daniel begins to explain starts off with a head of gold, arms of silver, and its belly and its thighs are bronze, and its legs are iron, and its feet and its toes are uh, partly mixed with iron and clay. So Daniel says the head of gold is Babylon. The silver is going to be the next empire that's going to take Babylon out. That is the Medo-Persian empire. That's what we're reading about in Isaiah chapter 47. Then the next is going to be the thighs of bronze, which is Greece, and then the legs of iron, which is Rome, and then the feet partly mixed with clay and iron, I believe is one of the last world empires which will be the empire of the Antichrist in the last days. So ultimately, what Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar, that your kingdom is the head of gold, but it's going to be defeated by the arms of silver, which is going to be the next empire. Now, keep in mind that as you look at this image, notice that it is metals. All of it is metals depreciating all the way down to clay and iron mixed together. And each of these empires are going to be defeated by the next one. Now, history tells us that Babylon came into power, as we're looking at here, ultimately was defeated by the Medo-Persian Empire. And remember, in chapter 45, God said that he raised one up to defeat Babylon. And guess who that man was? 200 years before he was even born, his name is mentioned, Cyrus. He is the Medo-Persian king who we read about in Daniel chapter 4, his empire defeated the Babylonian empire just like God said through the prophet Daniel. So the point being made here is we see that God clearly raises a nation up like he told Habakkuk he was going to do, and he would rise Babylon up into power for one purpose, to take the people of Judah captive. And then as he takes them captive for 70 years, they will be in captivity, and when their captivity is done, Another empire will come into power and destroy them. And he gives the name of the leader of that empire, Cyrus, and it is the Medo-Persian Empire. And that's exactly what took place according to history. Now, there it is. Not only is it the rise of a nation, but also 
the destruction of a nation, that this is all by God's doing. Now remember that all of this has to do with God encouraging his people that no matter the circumstances they face or what they experience in life, God is sovereign even over the greatest nations of the earth. One of man's greatest weakness is, is that they put hope, they put trust, they put faith in a nation for things that only God can do for us. And the Lord is saying, do you not understand that I am the Lord God? As Genesis says, and all throughout the Psalms, the judge of all the earth. In chapters 46 and 47, God promises to defeat Babylon. He says he will humble them and destroy them. Now, listen to this. This is years before it happens. Babylon was not defeated until the year 539 B.C. But the Lord is saying here that this nation served a purpose. Now, we also see that a bit further in verse 6, they went beyond that purpose. This is where their judgment now comes. But listen to what the Lord is saying here. God is saying that he will destroy this physical nation, Babylon, that'll be great in power. Now, we looked last week at its inception. Where did Babylon begin? Well, it began in Genesis chapter 11. We know the story very well. Remember in Genesis chapter 10, right around verse 8, we see the story of a man by the name of Nimrod. It says that Nimrod was a man that was, according to his estimation, a great man in his day. The Bible says in verse 8 that he was a mighty one. And this man, Nimrod, the Bible goes on to say in verse 9 of Genesis 10 that, that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, what's interesting here, the, the, the picture of mighty hunter before the Lord, the idea means here hunting like hunting game. It has nothing to do with that he was a great man who went out and did great things. No, he had a desire that was not godly. His desire was to be like God. Um, in the original language, the idea here has to do with mighty hunter before the Lord, meaning that he was a hunter of the souls of men. His desire was to dominate humanity in his day. So in a sense, he wanted to be like God. And remember that this is what we read about in Isaiah chapter 14, starting in verse 12, where that word that's given in direction toward Lucifer. And the word there was that his desire was that he wanted to be like God. That his desire was that he wanted his throne to be where God's throne was. Well, this clearly shows us what we see also in Ezekiel chapter 28, where that warning is given to the king of Tyre. And then all of a sudden, as we see that warning that God is saying, we're going to destroy uh, the king of Tyre, we're going to destroy this people. And then it goes into the description in Ezekiel 28 and verse 12, a description about this anointed cherub. This is none other than Lucifer himself. And this is interesting. When God is speaking about two nations in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28, he then begins to give a description of Satan. This would lead me to believe that though God is the one who raises nations up and God is the one who tears them down, this also leads me to believe that the Lord is saying that there are nations that are ruled by men that are influenced and empowered by Satan. And this is why the term is given that there are evil nations and nations that are diabolical. There is not going to be no worse nation than this confederation of nations that will make a one world government in the end times. All of this is to remind us that God can destroy a physical nation that is great and powerful, but God will also destroy a spiritual nation. And there are these um, thoughts here in the scriptures concerning that which is spiritual. Now, remember, when Nimrod decided to build this kingdom, always look at this play on words. Look at when you get to chapter 11, and we looked at this last week, the Tower of Babel. He wanted to build a tower. He says that we could reach to the heavens. His desire was to be in the heavens. He wanted to be high, and he felt that if we can get this high, then we would be the epicenter of the world in his day, that all would come here to worship. He wanted to deify himself. Let's just look at play on words. The name Nimrod itself means rebellion. It's exactly what his name means. His name means rebellion. We also see here that he began something. 
he actually started his kingdom. And guess what it says here in verse 10 of Genesis 10? That the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And remember that the reason why we call the place Babel in the land of Shinar is because the word Babel means confusion. It means confusion by mixing, if you will. The idea there is it's all scrambled up. It's all mixed up. It's all confusion. You can't, you can't understand it. So that's what Babylon actually means. So Nimrod, whose name means rebellion, he builds his kingdom called confusion. And any time a man tries to deify himself, he's confused. But we also see here that it doesn't stop there. And, and it says here, not only was his kingdom Babel, it says here it also was Erech. Now, the name Erech means, it, it, it kind of gives us the idea of measurement. It means long. So in other words, the idea on play on words is that this would be a kingdom that would be pursued by man, not just one time, but it would be something that would tarry. It would be one of man's greatest weaknesses. And then we also see here that the next is, it says, and akkad, which means septal. It means the idea really here is, um, the root word actually means strength. And the idea here is that it would be powerful. It would be something that would be uh, there in place, not easily removed. And it also says, and it goes on to say, and kelna. Now, kelna or, kel or kelno means fortress of anu. Another idea there in regards to a fortress and a strength and a power and then it says here, in the land of Shinar. And this is where I think it's kind of interesting. So we look at all this, and all these words speak of power. It speaks of strength. And this is just a play on Hebrew words, okay? That's all it is, just something to look at. But, but that really is Nimrod's desire. He wants to be like God. And then he demonstrates that in the next chapter by building this Tower of Babel. Then we know what the Lord did, does. He confuses the language and the place there is known from that day forward as Babel. And it's attributed to a guy whose name is Rebellion. And in Rebellion, you will always be confused, so to speak. But then it says in the land of Shinar, the word Shinar actually means country of two rivers. And I think this is pretty cool because it reminds me of something. You see, at the very start there in the book of Genesis, this man desired to be like God. This man wanted the, to dominate the world. There's only one who's in control. It's the Lord God. But Nimrod wanted that control. He was obsessed with that control. But look at what happens. And I love this picture here. So just to play on words, guys, I just want to give you something just to kind of mess with as you read the word. But I think this is really cool. In 1 Kings, in chapter 18, we see the story of Elijah as he is dealing with the people there in his day. And he's now going to Mount Carmel to destroy the prophets of Baal. We know the story. But what's powerful is, is what Elijah says in verse 21 of chapter 18. And I think this has to do with not only a play on words on these names in Genesis 10 that leads up to this rebellion in man, but I think it's something we all have to listen to. Notice what he says here. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? How long will you falter between two opinions? Now, notice this. He's saying, how long, some translations say, will you waver between two opinions? How long would you do that? Now, remember, at the close of the book of Joshua, remember what Joshua says to the people. Joshua says to the people, listen, you're, you're either going to serve the Lord your God, you're either going to worship the Lord God, or you're going to worship the gods of this land. But I love what he says. He says, as for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Joshua goes on to say this in verse 15 of chapter 24. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your, uh, which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And notice what happens here. Joshua is saying the same thing to the people. You're either going to serve the idols and the false gods, or you're going to serve the Lord God. 
When Nimrod desired to build the Tower of Babel in the land of Shinar, the name means, you know, the country with two rivers. Listen, it was a crossroads for them. The people could have easily followed Nimrod and said, we're going to follow this guy who is confused. <laughs> He's the founder of confusion, so to speak. But what does the Bible say? God is not the author of confusion. Well, we know who is. And we could see here very clearly that God is sovereign over any nation. And we see that God disrupted the plan of Nimrod there in chapter 11 of Genesis. But we also see here now the actual city of itself. So the inception there in Genesis chapter 11, we also see its kingdom in the book of Daniel. The whole book of Daniel was written by Daniel as he was a captive in the palace of Babylon. He was there. You want a good reckoning of what Israel's captivity was like, you read the book of Daniel, read the book of Ezekiel. But now the Lord is saying here, this nation that was great and powerful, this nation that was strong is going to be destroyed. Ultimately, Babylon was. Now, this is clearly here way before Babylon's destruction. But the Lord is saying, this is how it's going to end. Babylon will go down. Now, I'll tell you, we're going to look at the pride of Babylon here. But the first thing the Lord does is he calls Babylon to vacate her throne. Now, remember, that was really hard for Nebuchadnezzar to do. Because in Daniel chapter 4, God explained to Nebuchadnezzar, all that you have has been by my doing. And then Nebuchadnezzar turns around and says, look at all that I've done by the work of my hand. Babylon would ultimately be destroyed because it was a part of God's purpose and plan. Verse 1 goes on to say, come down and sit in the dust. O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground with a throne, without a throne, excuse me, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Now notice the first thing the Lord says in regards to calling Babylon to vacate her throne. He says, come down. The idea behind the word come down in the Hebrew is yarad, which means the direction of going downward. What he's actually saying is, Babylon, you're going down you will come to an end. And not only, it's not going to be just losing a battle, that is going to be where you will remain. And he says here, come down and sit. And the Hebrew word there uh, for sit actually means to dwell. You're going to remain downward and in the dust. Now, the idea here behind the word dust is a great morning. Remember there in Jonah chapter 3, when Jonah went and ministered to the people of Nineveh, gave them God's message. And what did the king of Nineveh do when he heard it? He was convicted. And the Bible says that he literally sat down in the ashes. He humbled himself and he sat down in the ashes and he mourned greatly over the sin of Nineveh. And this is a great sign of mourning. You see, Babylon had never known what it was to mourn. In their heyday, they were in the height of power. They never knew what it would be to mourn. They made many other nations mourn. But the Lord is saying, your day of mourning and sitting in defeat is coming. And then he calls, he reminds them of their position. Oh, virgin daughter of Babylon. Why does he call her? Why does he call Babylon a virgin? Well, nobody has ever conquered you. In other words, in that area, you are pure. You're without spot. You're without blemish. In a sense, you have yet to be defiled. But he goes on to say here, sit on the ground without a throne. He's reminding Babylon that the kingdom will be defeated. He said, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Once again, that reminder of her position. Like a virgin, once pristine and perfect, its status having never been in dread. He says, your days of dread are coming, and you're no longer going to be tender and delicate. You're no longer going to be great and powerful. Now listen, when Babylon was ultimately destroyed, we read that in Daniel chapter 5, we also see that that was the end. 539 BC, but that's not the end of Babylon being referred to in Scripture. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, Peter closes out his first epistle and he likens Rome to Babylon. 
He actually calls Rome Babylon. He says, and to Babylon, which was really Rome, because the Roman Empire was in power in his day. And that's kind of how it went down. Remember, it was Babylon, then the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Grecian Empire with Alexander the Great, and then we see with the Roman Empire up into the New Testament. But here's the picture here. So in a sense, he's saying spiritually, Rome is like Babylon. Another thing that we see here as well is we see that later on in the book of Revelation, we also hear of Babylon again. We hear of Babylon in chapter 14, chapter 16, chapter 17. We see the destruction of Babylon. We see its demise. And some people ask the question, is this Babylon revived? The answer is no. It's a spiritual Babylon. What is a spiritual Babylon? The spirit of Babylon. Nimrod? a man of rebellion, Babel, confusion, a desire to dominate the people, to be a, a hunter of men for souls, for the purpose of, of, of ruling. It's, it's humanism at its finest. And what we see here clearly is that the spiritual Babylon will also be defeated in the end times. Now, there's no way of reading through Isaiah 47 and reading the humiliation and the destruction of Babylon without understanding even in our present day there are great nations that you have lived to see as an individual. We have record, we have history, and we're taught this. This nation, which is not very old, you know, uh, less than 300 years old, right? And, and yet we've seen the rise, and we are seeing with our own eyes the fall of this nation. And you would love, your human nature would love to blame it on a person or a political party. Nobody's to blame. It's all going according to plan. God is sovereign over this nation, not man. God is sovereign over every nation on this planet. And when you and I wonder, when are those people going to get dealt with? When are they going to, when, when, you know, when's God going to do? Listen, don't worry. It's all written here. This is what relieves us of the worry of all these current events that we see and, and people, you know, asking me, and it's okay, ask, but I'm going to tell you the same thing. Listen, we should be encouraged when we see these things taking place. This is what Jesus said last week when we looked at Luke's gospel in chapter 21, where Jesus told the disciples something very important because they wanted to know when Jesus was going to come back and do his thing. His thing to them was establishing his kingdom. They wanted Rome to be dealt with by Jesus. They really, the disciples were like, so when... They asked him more than once. They asked him in Matthew 24 and 25, Luke 21. So when will this be? When will your kingdom come? Remember in the book of Acts in chapter 1, is now the time? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the time or the seasons. You see, they had a desire for Jesus' kingdom to come and destroy. In a sense, the disciples also had an idea of an earthly kingdom. And Jesus answered that question before Pontius Pilate. See, in our humanity, we look for an earthly kingdom, but... Listen to this. It's God in heaven who delivers his people, Israel. It's God who delivers his people no matter the circumstance or situation. And Jesus said this in verse 25 of Luke 21, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distresses of nation with perplexity. Wow. The sea and the, and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. Boy, hasn't fear become a big thing? And if you guys think this invasion right now that we're seeing before our very eyes is like the worst thing that's ever happened, there's worse atrocities that are not reported. There's other nations being invaded by other nations that we're not over here crying over. It's just that this nation has its interests, its pride and its arrogance in certain other nations. But I'll tell you what, it's also all going according to plan. So when we see this invasion, what we need to be praying for is what we should always be praying for, for more missionaries to go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And just as much as there's believers in Ukraine, there's believers in Russia too. But all this is going according to plan. Nothing should take you by surprise. Listen to this. Jesus also said this, men's hearts failing them for fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. You know, what Jesus is saying, there's going to come a time where fear will rule more than not. For some of us that maybe grew up in, you know, the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. I'm an, I'm an 80s kid, you know, and, and the 90s, you know. There wasn't fear in the world like there is today. 
You know, when I was a kid, you know, I mean, it wasn't that bad. I mean, there was like bad things, but not that bad. Like we could play outside. It was all good. Now today you can't. It's crazy. I'm just giving you that context. Some of you that grew up in the 50s and 60s, you know, half the time you didn't even lock your front door. You lived in certain neighborhoods where there was no fear. You didn't worry. Now, you got cameras. You got everything. You got it on your iPhone. You wake up in the middle of the night just to see who's at the front door. I mean, we live in so much fear. And you know how much money in the billions, if not trillions, spent on security everywhere? What is that from? From the fear of man. Jesus said fear will increase. Listen to this. And he goes on to say here, and with the expectation with those things are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. So Jesus says, see, all this craziness is actually leading to me coming again. So when you see these things starting to happen, he says, the end is not yet. But your direction shouldn't be on a person or a nation or a people. As we said last week, your head shouldn't be in a hole in the ground. We should be looking upward. We should have a peace in our heart that all this stuff that you're worried about, like the gas prices that you're worried about, because that's all you're putting all over social media. Nothing to laugh about. But this goes back to man's fear. Listen to this, guys. In all this saying, Jesus is saying, if anything, for the believer whose heart is fixed upon Jesus, this is the most assuring and reassuring thing that is happening for the church today. Because for years, the world has mocked us. For years, people have made fun of us because we are followers of Jesus Christ and we believe everything that's written in this book. And you know what? You don't even have to say anything today. Just turn on the TV. It's all happening before our eyes. Jesus says, when you see these things, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. Look at what Peter, uh, Paul says, and I love this too. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verses 13, all the way down to verse 17, he's speaking about the rapture of the church, okay? But listen to this. At the end of it all, he says this, therefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. That we are to use... Christ's second coming, the rapture of the church. And, you know, I'm always very careful with the videos that they edit to use to promote the service. And sometimes I have to tell them, no, I don't like that. Do it, Get something else out of the sermon. And I was about to do that with the one that we put up for today. But I sat there for a little bit and I stopped and I said, no, we need more of this. Because I said some things that I could tell probably make some people cringe. And trust me, I get emails. People criticize me all the time for things I say, but it's okay. I'm, I'm not worried about that. But I said something to the nature of, you know, get your head out of the ground. And I says, and you better be ready because you will be left behind. You know, and I remember some years ago, you know, men that I respect saying, you know, all that whole thing about the rapture and the end times and the prophecy drum, you know, we need to stop beating that because Christians think they're not, they're not you know, worthy enough to, to be taken up in the rapture. I think what that does is it shouldn't put a fear if we're going to miss it. Listen, some of you are. Some of you are. I would be lying to you if I said, oh, I know everybody's going, everybody that comes to Living Way is going to make the rapture of the church. Some of you will be left behind. Just like many will be. But there should be an expectation in our heart. And some people say, well, I don't want to be left behind. Well, then fall in love with Jesus, not yourself. Because when you're in love with him and your focus is him and he's seen in everything that you do, you are waiting for that time. Your lives lived in anticipation for his coming. And what do you do in the meantime? You don't twiddle your thumbs. You advance his kingdom by the proclamation of the gospel. Because it should stir your heart to want to share the word of God more with others because you know that for those that are left behind, for those that step into it even more powerful, for those that step into eternity without Christ, there's no second chance. <laughs> I even giggled a little bit about what I said because I don't remember half the things I said. That was just in first service. But I said this, if you miss the rapture, there's no second bus that comes. And that's true. Those that are left behind, Revelation tells you exactly what's going to happen play by play. 
But here's what I will say, is that when we are discouraged and overwhelmed with things that are taking place, like the Lord told Habakkuk, I'm working a work. And if I were to explain it to you, you wouldn't understand it, but here's what you do know. Psalm 75 in verses five through seven says that God's in control. Here's another word of comfort. Listen to this passage. I thought this was pretty cool. I was reading it this morning. In Psalm 121, I just love this, just the way it's written. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. Where does your help come from? That is a good question. My help, the psalmist says, look it, I don't know where your help comes from, but I'm going to tell you where mine comes from. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Just, not just the Lord, the creator of all things. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Wow. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither sleep nor slumber. In other words, God is not aloof. He's not dismissive of what's happening. Everything is going according to plan. But remember what he told Judah? When you do find yourself in that time and you do ask yourself, you know, when you are in captivity and Babylon's in control and then you're wondering where the Lord God is, you're wondering, has God forgotten about me? Remember, he told him that because those days are gonna come. When you start to think, where is God in the midst of all this craziness? In chapter 40, in verse 27, he told the people of Judah, he says, you will say things, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. The Lord is saying, the days are going to come when you think I'm not there. The days are going to come when you see all this stuff take place. And for Judah in particular, it's going to blow your mind that a nation was able to take you captivity. But you know that that was my doing. And when those moments of weakness come, hold on to the promises of God's word. Your captivity is a part of of the purpose and plan of your call. Your captivity by Babylon is me working on your behalf because of your idolatry and sinfulness. I love you too much to make you think that you are serving me when you're worshiping idols. So I gotta take you to this captivity to remove the idolatry from the land, and then after 70 years, I'll bring you back into the land and get it right now, because we serve a God who neither sleeps nor slumbers who's always working out. And look at what he says. When those difficult days come, and you and I, listen, this is speaking about Israel, but let me tell you something. As a child of God, as a Christian, when you get all up in your feelings, because you know we do, and we make it all about us, and why me, and why am I going through this, and we whine our way through our Christian walk, let me tell you something. Newsflash, it's not about you. And the Lord is saying, when you think, I'm not there, when the enemy is lying to you and your mind is playing tricks on you, the Lord says, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable and he gives power to the weak. Listen to this. The Lord is saying, I'm there and I'm working. And in the same way that Babylon will be a nation of power, I will make it a nation that is nothing. He says, I will subdue it. He goes on to say here in chapter 45, he says to subdue nations before him, or excuse me, chapter 47. He says to take the millstone and grind a mill, remove your veil, take off the skirt, uncover the thigh, pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Yes, your shame will be seen. And I will take vengeance. I will not arbitrate with a man. So notice now he says to Babylon, not only are you like a virgin, are you tender and delicate? He says, you will no longer have a throne. You will no longer have a kingdom. You will be exposed. Listen to this in verse two. He says, take a millstone and grind mill. Who does that? Only servants do. You know what he's saying to Babylon? You're going from a kingdom that was dominating to a kingdom that will no longer be, and you will be servants. Something they were never used to. And he goes on to say here, you will be exposed. And you will be stripped. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. 
And then he goes on to say in the rest of verse 3, I will. And I underlined that in my Bible. Why? Because the Lord is saying, when that does happen to Babylon, we need to remember that it was the Lord's doing. It was the Lord's doing. God says, I will take vengeance and I will not arbitrate with men. Now, we looked at this last week, but I just want to touch on this very quickly. The word here, arbitrate, means to impinge. In other words, you know, this cannot be talked out. The judgment is already given, Babylon. It's done. It's part of the plan. It's part of the process. I will not arbitrate with man. It's kind of like what we see in Genesis 6, 3, where it says that the Spirit of God will not strive with man much longer. In other words, we can't chase the change, excuse me, the course of God's plan. What we do do as believers is we surrender and submit to what God knows. Listen to this, guys. We also see that the Lord will not arbitrate with man, nor will his spirit strive with man. But God's not done with man. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 1 and verse 18, what does it say? God says to man, come, now let us reason together. Though your sins are as red as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I'll make them white as wool. God will not arbitrate with man, and his spirit will not strive with man, but God will reason with man. And we know that that's speaking about Jesus Christ. See, God's not done. God has a purpose. God has a plan. God has the ultimate end for Babylon, and the people of Judah should be rejoicing, just like you and I should rejoice when we read the word and we see everything that's going on today. We should rejoice because in the end, we win. We're going to be with the Lord. I mean, we win. Now, listen, that doesn't mean we go around and just say, hey, we already know how it's going to end. Let's just live our lives to the fullest. No, we're to pray. We're to share the gospel. There are people that need to know the word of God. And this is what we're to be doing. But what does all this do, Pastor David? What does all this do for me? It reminds you that we can trust God's word. He even goes on to say in verse 4, For as our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, His name, the Holy One of Israel. I love here how it says the Lord of hosts. Well, the Redeemer, the word there in the Hebrew is Goel, right? The kinsman Redeemer, the only one who can what? Redeem. According to the law, it was a person who was next of kin that can go and buy back property that belong to you, your relatives, your family. Jesus is, in a sense, next of kin to us. He is he is flesh of all flesh. He was not 50-50. He was 100% man, 100% God. Jesus is our Goel. And he redeemed humanity. He went and purchased it back with the work of the cross. He became our redeemer. But God is the one who redeems his people. And I love how he says here, the Lord of hosts. The word there, host, actually uh, also has the idea of a heavenly host. But it's the same word that's used in the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 11 in regards to the stars, the host of heaven. And remember that the Lord rebuked in chapter 46 the false gods of the people of Babylon, their false god, Bel. And then he had a son named Nebo, and that is the god of astrology, <laughs> god of the signs in the skies. You know, have you ever just thought about how amazing this was when the Magi's went to go and look for Jesus? Um, what was it that they were following? because they're from Chaldea. They were from Babylon. These magis were from that region. They were stargazers. They were, they were those who worshiped. Well, how did they get hooked up with the word of God if they didn't even have the word of God? It wasn't given to them. Well, the word of God, I believe, was taught to them by none other than Daniel, who remained in Babylon even after the captivity was over. He never left. It's crazy how God would use these magis and to tell the whole world that the Savior is born. But I love this here, what the Lord is saying. I think this is another play on words here. The Bible says in Psalm 33 and verse 6 that, that God put the stars in their place. He named them all. And the Lord is saying, do you not know who I am? I'm the one who created the stars that you think are a God. I'm the one who's in control and the creator of all things. And he says in verse 5, sit in silence and go into darkness. In other words... Sit in silence, meaning you will be stopped, you will be shut up, and go into darkness. Darkness is a picture of sorrow and suffering. Babylon had never suffered. But he says your day is going to come, and you will suffer. And notice here, 
that the Lord is saying to them, not only will they suffer, he says, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no longer be called the lady of kingdoms. Now, this is interesting here because what we see here is God saying their reign is gonna come to an end. So verses one through four, God calls Babylon to vacate her throne. And here we see in verses five and six, the wrath of God, his vengeance that's going to come. He's gonna shut her up. There's gonna be sorrow and suffering. And he says, you will no longer be called the lady of kingdoms. In other words, the mistress of kingdoms. Remember in the book of Revelation in chapter 16, we see this whore, they call it the whore of Babylon, riding the beast, right? And, and the picture there, a lot of times people have said, oh, you know, we know who that is. That some said, uh, you know, it's the Catholic church, you know, and it's, it's, it's Muslims and it's this and that. Let, let me tell you something. Today, those are the false religious systems that we face. Babylon will not be revived. Some people really thought that when Babylon reemerges in the book of Revelation, that it's somehow it's going to be revived. It, it's not. Remember that uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, that, that, that is modern-day Babylon. What was his desire? To rebuild the ruins of Babylon. He says, I'm going to do this. Not too long after that, he was taken off the scene. So what is Babylon in the book of Revelation? There is a false religious system, and some try to have put some of the major denominations of the world today. Listen, at the end of the day, I stated this earlier, and I'll, state again, I'll say it again. Any cult and any false religious system of today is not even going to be close enough to the wickedness of the false religion of that day. It's going to be far greater than what we can conjure up. See, we created these religions today. The false religious system of Babylon in the end times, that's going to be far worse, way more wicked than what we see today. And I'll tell you what, we're not going to be here to see it. At least that's what I believe. So I really don't care who it is. But I will tell you this. In my day, I've seen religion used for wickedness. I've seen man's uh, ability to be easily deceived by religion. And I've seen what a person is willing to do in the name of religion. And the Bible tells us that what we see today as evil and as wickedness is going to be far worse in those days. So the question that I'm always asked, are we in the last days? The answer is yes, we are. Since when? Since Christ was risen from the dead. At least that's what the book of Hebrews tells us. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past through the prophets and our fathers, through the fathers and the prophets. He says, this is how God spoke. But in these last days, has spoken to us through his son. The last days begin with Jesus and they end with Jesus. Jesus is the beginning and the end. Like he says in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beauty of all of this, guys, is this, is that we see here that he says, this lady of kingdoms, and I want you guys to really understand this here. They will no longer be a nation greater and above all else. See, all the nations looked to Babylon in their day. They aspired to be, but could never reach that. And just like the spiritual Babylon of our day, that it'll gain momentum. And listen, guys, I believe it's not just going to be a type of religion, I believe it's going to be the worship of man in ways that we've never seen. You think you're appalled by what's happening now with the gender issue and all that's happening? How far are we going to go? Tolerance of the L, B, G, T, Q, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P movement. I mean, all of these things. Listen, yes, pray. But just so you know, you know, the next generation of, of, of church churches and the gospel, if the Lord tarries, is going to be people that are coming out of that life. God's going to work. You think that's bad. We have no clue in our mind how bad it's going to be. This false religious system and all this, this one world, to be able to control the world through this one system is going to be unbelievable. Imagine the power of that control. And I think God gave us snippets even with what's recently happened with this pandemic how the whole world can come crumbling over one thing. Just the Lord just saying, just know 
that what I say in my word is true. Listen to this. And when we're worried about who's going to step in and who's going to defend this nation that's being invaded, who's going to step in and defend any nation that's being invaded? God is. It's all going according to plan. If you ask me a question and you say, Pastor David, so you mean to tell me that what's happening right now over there, I already know what you're going to ask me. You're going to say that that was God's doing? No, listen, there is nothing that's happening outside of God's control or sovereignty. It's all going according to plan. We're going to get into that before we close. But look at what happens here. He says, I was angry with my people and I have profaned my inheritance and gave them into your hand. You showed them no mercy. So what is he saying? You were an instrument to deal with Judah. Listen to this. But you took advantage. You didn't conquer Judah. I gave you Judah is what the Lord's saying. But then he says here, here's the problem though. You showed no mercy. Here's the reason for their destruction. They went beyond what God allowed them to. Because Nebuchadnezzar wanted to be like God. He says, you showed no mercy on the elderly. You laid your yoke very heavily. Daniel chapter 4, verse 27. And you said, I shall be a lady forever. Notice the arrogance of Babylon. Like I am untouchable. I am I'm invincible. Nobody can do anything to me. So that you did not take these things to heart. Wow. Nor remember the latter end of them. The Lord is saying, Babylon, you truly thought you were untouchable. The arrogance and the pride of a nation, the Lord is saying, newsflash, because I'm the one who raises it up and tears it down, it will come to an end. Therefore, hear this now, you who were given to pleasures, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, listen to this, I am, whoa, there's only one who says I am, and there is no one else beside me, I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. These are two things that could happen to a woman that are very sad, and it's a very difficult, sorrowful situation. And the two things the Lord is saying is going to happen to, spiritually speaking, to Babylon, as a woman who thinks that she could never be destroyed, she will lose her husband and lose her family. Babylon says, I will not sit as a widow, nor will I lose my children. But these two things shall come to you in a moment. In one day, the loss of children and widowhood, they shall come upon you in their fullness. Why? Because of the multitude of your sorceries and the great abundance of your enchantments. Listen to this. These are the charges against them. In other words, he's saying, listen, you're going to be destroyed for you have trusted in your wickedness. You have said, no one sees me. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.13, that all things are open and naked before the Lord. You've trusted in your wickedness, your idolatry. You've trusted in your wealth and in your power and in your army and your wisdom and your knowledge have warped you. In other words, they led you astray. You thought you could do this. You thought you were the one in charge. You have said in your heart again, a second time, I am. Only God can invoke this statement. Like in Exodus chapter three, in verse 14, who do I send me? God says, Tell them, I am has sent you. Only God says, I am. Deuteronomy 32, 39. The idea here of claiming invincibility. And here's the sad reality. Even believing it. Therefore, evil shall come upon you. You shall not know from where it arises. And trouble shall fall, fall upon you. And you will not be able to put it off. And desolation shall come upon you suddenly, which you shall not know. And I love this here. He says, stand now with your enchantments and the multitude of your sorceries in which you have labored from your youth. Remember the youth? We talked about its inception, Genesis chapter 10 and 11. Its kingdom, Daniel chapters 1 through 5. And now its destruction, Isaiah chapter 47. In other words, see if your idols, your pride, your army, your wealth can save you. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. You were wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you. In other words, he's saying they can't speak the future. They can't help you. Only God can. You're not the I am. I am. 
The Lord said in Isaiah 41 in verse 23, there is no other God before me who can declare the things to the ancient people and then come to pass. Nobody can. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves. For the power of the flame, it shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. Thus shall they be to you with whom you have labored, your merchants from your youth, they shall wander each one to his quarter. No one will save you. Isn't that powerful? No one will save you. This is just the Lord in 15 verses just dismantling its entire reign as a nation and as a people. Babylon, you will no longer exist as a people or a world power, and you will not have your security in what you thought it would be for, your, for yourself, for your glory, for your doing. It'll all come to an end. And you look at this and you see what the Lord was speaking to them and reminding them that, listen, all this will come to an end. Babylon's reign. It ended. The Babylonian Empire, known by Nebuchadnezzar and its reign in the Bible, reigned from 605 to 538 B.C. Medo-Persian Empire reigned a little bit longer. The Grecian Empire reigned a little bit longer than the Medo-Persian Empire. And the Roman Empire reigned over 500 years. Ultimately, here's the point. All of these great world empires, as we know it, all ended. So the question here is God is promising the people of Judah, listen, I will destroy Babylon. I raised it up. I will take it out. Who's going to be in charge today? Who's going to step in? Who's going to listen? If you're wondering what's going on, you know, last week I just referred to this. I want to give you guys a mental picture in your head. But I, I told you guys to when you guys, you know, just look it up. When you see, you know, the leader of Iran, the leader of Russia, the leader of Turkey, all aligning themselves in agreement. This just happened a couple of years ago, but look at this a picture. It's it's pretty remarkable. When I saw that picture, I was like, praise the Lord. I'm so glad they're friends now. Because that just tells me I'm that much more closer. Because the Bible said this was going to happen. Now, I, I created this little thing for you guys this morning. So I want you to get a mental note of why. I referred to Ezekiel 38 last week. And I just talked about these nations. And I want you to get this. Listen, I'm no... I don't know how to, I just did this on Canva, okay? I did this real quick. I'm not a scholar or nothing like that. It's just something I made. And I says, I'm going to make this for them, and I want you guys to see this. So what I did was I, I went on Google, the almighty Google, and I just put Israel, and I took a picture of a map on there, just on there. And I put it in the app, and then I made these little arrows on there. I didn't make them. The app did, okay? And I typed in all the names. Listen, so we have what it says in Ezekiel 38 with modern-day names, okay? So look at this. They're all pointing to what? Israel, right there. And listen to this. So remember in Ezekiel 38, you have Gog. That is more of a title of a ruler, Gog. Magog, right there. Magog is actually all of those. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, uh, Afghanistan, all of that area. That is Magog. Persia, Persia is modern-day Iran. Look at that. Gomer is Germany up there in the corner. Meshach, Tubal, and Kagrama is modern-day Turkey. Isn't that interesting? Libya, they never changed their name. It's still the same, Libya. And then you have Ethiopia, which would encompass Sudan and Ethiopia. And when you look at all of these here, it's interesting that you begin to see these are all the nations. Now, here's what's more remarkable. The Bible says, and you look at Rush up there, that's Russia. There's Moscow right there. Russia's up there. There's Ukraine. That's what's happening in this invasion. You know how I see it? I'm just like, man, in this invasion here, they know they can't come through this side because they're not going to invade. They're going to have an alliance there. They want to be able to surround, guess who? Israel. And Russia's already made its way there. You see right above Israel, you got Lebanon, right? We've been on that border of Lebanon. And right above that, you have Syria. Isn't that interesting? Here they are, all shaking hands. Russia and Iran are on the northern border of Israel. And Ezekiel 38 says Israel will be attacked, attacked by the north, by Rosh, and by Persia, and by, listen, Meshach, Tubal, and Targma by Turkey. 
They're already there. So if you're wondering, why is this happening? And if you're concerned about gas prices, it's really nothing to laugh at, but this is what blows me away. You guys should be looking at this and saying, you know, it's interesting. The book of Revelation says that one day a price of bread, a loaf of bread is going to be a day's wage. You wonder, how's that going to happen? Look at what's happening now. Why is this happening now? I'm not saying we're living in those days. I'm just saying the Lord is saying, church, are you awake? Have I not told you all these things are going to take place? When I see all these things taking place, and I want you to take note of this in the word. When you see all these things taking place, Jesus said in Luke chapter 21, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. You need not to fear. You need not to worry. The Lord's in control. Listen to this. We should be praying for all that is taking place, but more than anything, we should be living our lives for Christ. Christianity is not a religion. It's not a tradition. It's not a social club. It's you dying to yourself and living for Christ. This is stuff that you shouldn't have to wait for me to teach you. This is stuff you should already know. Because if you say you love someone, you know everything about them. If you love Jesus with all of your heart, this just encourages you to live for him more. And in these days, the believer shouldn't be worried about the price of gas. I mean, come on, guys. Let's just think realistically. I mean, come on. They just pumped all kinds of money into this economy. Stimulus like crazy. That's what's going to pay for the gas. You guys, you guys, come on. This, dude, I got a GED in prison. Next heroin, fiend. come on now. You didn't see this coming? They're going to get that money back some way. Like, oh, Target, $24 an hour. Go ahead. Have at it. Praise God, you got work. Oh, they raised minimum wage. Yeah, they're going to raise other things too. They'll get it back. So now what do I do? Do I worry? What do I do? Listen, look up. Our redemption draweth nigh. Serve God with all of your heart and live for him like never before. Amen. Amen.